This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Let's get started, Raleigh. What? You can't leave it there! Oh my... I am back from my short break away and I am ready to tackle the rest of this One Piece story. Fully energized to complete my quest to catch up with the rest of the world in this sprawling high seas adventure spanning almost 1,000 chapters as of writing this video. But as of my last video, part 12's completion, I have covered 597 chapters of this Japanese nautical epic as well as the first major section of this story. And with that now in the books, I thought this week, in addition to covering the reuniting of the Straw Hat crew during their return to Sabaudi, I thought it would be fun to also reveal my top five favorite arcs of the story and my personal ranking of all the Straw Hat Pirates. I think I've got a decent enough grasp of this merry band of misfits in order to effectively rank them accordingly right now, and that's not even to mention my favorite arcs also. But before all that, let me say I am back. But please, for the love of God, like and share this video because the algorithm probably hates me right now. But all of that aside, I am ready to tackle the rest of this incredible story, beginning with my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for the heartwarming, the tense, and the funny Return to Sabaudi. <laughs> By the way, I see your comments. Oh, Mark cries at everything. He's overly emotional. He needs to man up. First off, rude. But moreover, I don't actually cry that much. I meant it when I said that before reading One Piece, I never cried while reading before. Now, do I cry while watching films and TV shows? Yes, like a fountain, but that's besides the point. And what's more is, I haven't just been resting during this vacation from the world of One Piece, I've been training. I've been watching The Notebook, Marley and Me, and Your Name on loop for the past two weeks straight. And I can now proudly declare that not only do I not cry, but I am also an emotionless vacuum void of even the most fundamental basic level of humanity. So, with my newfound grit and determination, let's open the story and get back to work. Okay, I didn't actually cry here, but after taking my time away from this story, after having sunk so much time into it beforehand, it was sort of nice seeing the story kick off again after what was in universe two years worth of training and time spent apart. Effectively, this very short arc explores the changes that crew have undergone, including emotional, intellectual, and in many cases, physical changes. With everyone in varying degrees changing their appearances, they are after growing up considerably in the last two years, and that is very much made evident throughout this reintroduction of the Straw Hats as they rendezvous at the archipelago. So let's check it out, two years later. I think my favorite thing about this chapter is how it's framed and presented. The very last chapter I covered before this long breakaway in my last video saw the very last panel with Luffy placing his hat on a rock, symbolizing the beginning of his training and his long break away from his friends. And this chapter following the time skip sees that very hat on that rock, now covered in snow, signifying the passage of time and dedication Luffy has had in his training. But, and I am not sure how it's presented in the anime, but in the manga, this chapter takes expressed interest in not showing us, the audience, Luffy's face pretty much for the entire chapter, right up until the very end. The Straw Hat is back and he's on his way to meet his friends. Something I really like in this chapter too was the laid back and fun character reintroductions we got with the rest of the Straw Hat crew. We see Sanji, who now parts his hair on the other side. No, that's growth. We see Nami, and not to mention Usopp, who's gotten so much more buff. We see Chopper, Robin, Rayleigh, lots of reintroductions that filled me with all sorts of nostalgia I wasn't expecting heading back into this. However, the most interesting part of this small collection of chapters comes in the form of this group of imposter Straw Hat pirates. Every one of them pretending to be a particular part of the crew, drawing attention to their presence in the very area they were taken out last time on the very day the real Straw Hats are planning to leave. It's a little more on the convenience side than I'm used to with One Piece, but I'll leave things slide because I'm still enjoying it and we see moments like this when the real Luffy engages with the fake Luffy. That is a baller move if ever I did see one. However, the real reason this crew is important is primarily down to them being the catalyst for the real conflict of the arc. You see, the reason I called this convenient earlier is largely down to the fact that had they not been at that archipelago that particular day, exactly two years from when Luffy sent that message, the real Straw Hats wouldn't have had any conflict really at all that day when they were leaving. But needless to say, they do. And when the Navy catch up with the pirates regrouping at this archipelago, a very familiar scene begins forming. The pacifistas arrive. But this time, things are different. That 
that's right, Zoro's got one eye now. Well, that sucks for him, but seriously, it's really cool to see the progression all of these guys have gone through, communicating to us visually the stark difference between them then and them now. Oh, also, there's this really bad guy in the ranks of the fake straw hats that led them to be ultimately disbanded and taken over, who looks like he'll be important later considering how much focus he got on during these chapters and, I mean, just look at that character design. But moreover, the best part about this reintroduction to the series is the humor and flavor the arc set up for us. There's this tremendous sense of anticipation and joy when the Straw Hats are looking for each other at the archipelago. And when they all do eventually arrive at the Thousand Sunny after it's finished being prepped by Rayleigh for deep sea adventures, Luffy doesn't spend much time embracing or hugging them, but instead gets right back to business. They have an adventure to go on, and with that, they dive into the deep below. It's awesome, and I can't wait to see what's next. Also, shout out to Duval who kept the ship safe for like two years. What a guy! <laughs> but before we move on next week to the rest of this epic story with my review of Fishman Island, I thought with this being the natural break in the story, it would be the perfect time for me to share with you guys my top 5 favourite arcs and my rankings of the Straw Hat crew. I shared my personal rankings of the Straw Hat Pirates a few months ago on Twitter, so it'll be interesting to see how much that list has changed today and whether or not it will change again by the time I finish this story. But first things first. Time to list off TNM's top five favorite arcs from One Piece's first half. Even though it's not really a half, it's more like the first 60%. Choosing your favorite arcs in a long running series can be an excruciatingly difficult enterprise. Having to take into account your own personal feelings on the matter while also taking into consideration the broader context and significance it plays in the greater story. A troubling challenge for sure. If you're a scrub, today I present Totally Not Mark's perfectly balanced and clearly objective list of the absolute best arcs in One Piece. And if yours isn't on here, that means Means you're objectively wrong and I'm absolutely calling your taste trash. This is a joke. So, what are we waiting for? Let's kick things off with number five, the Skypia arc. <laughs> Funnily enough, while I write this, I get the distinct impression that there will be a large number of you that will take specific issue with Skypia making my list of favorite arcs from this first section of the series. And while I can't speak to how the anime told the story specifically, I can only speak to my own experiences. And I found Skypia to not only be incredibly fun, but even after all has been said and done, it might actually be the most most ambitious standalone arc I've read of One Piece. While it does lean on material established in Jaya, the Skypia arc, even discounting the aspects from Jaya, establishes so much and pays off everything in a single story arc. An entirely new aesthetic for the world's environments, new technology, many new cultures with their own visible social structures, as well as hints to powers that become incredibly important the longer the story pushes forward. And perhaps the most impressive aspect is that these superlative world building attributes in form the story being told and its conclusion. I described Skypiea as a combination of Dances with Wolves, Indiana Jones, and Jack and the Beanstalk, and to be honest, I stand by that. It's got the magic of a fairy tale, the adventure to rival any of Indiana Jones's best, and it has a sense of foreboding that distinctly reminds me of the frontier in North America. Juggling literal magic, incredible fight scenes, and complex social dynamics that create such a specific flavor that it's unmistakably, specifically Skypiea. This arc I adore and it has an identity more distinct than any other on this list. Number four, Arlong Park. If you can't pay the cash, then you're out with the trash. If not for Arlong Park, this entire One Piece series I've created might not have existed. Something a lot of you might not be aware of is that when I decided to tackle this One Piece story, I did so with only two videos planned concretely. The first covering Romance Dawn to Barate and the second covering the events of Arlong Park. I had said to myself and my friends at the time that if the story had not captured my own interest or my audiences at that point, I would have stopped there and then, not having continued the story at all. But this arc, Arlong Park changed my perspective on One Piece entirely, transforming from a sort of ordinary shonen adventure story to an emotionally mature action drama dealing with themes and personal dilemmas that not only served to hold my interest, but as many of you became aware of during this video series, acted as the impetus for me to become incredibly attached to these characters in a way that I had not experienced with stories I had grown up with. Taking the primary point of view character to be Nami, we get tons of backstory and real life struggle that not only build up an incredibly tragic picture of Nami's life up until that point, but also a powerfully emotional interaction between two spectacular characters, the likes of which I hadn't personally been exposed to before. Arlong Park hits emotional highs that rival any of the other arcs in my opinion. Number 3. 
Water 7. I spent a shocking amount of time deliberating which I'd include on this list from the Water 7 saga, the Water 7 arc or Innie's Lobby. And to be perfectly honest, I was a much bigger fan of Water 7 than the latter. Now, that's not to say that I didn't enjoy or love Innie's Lobby. It was brilliant. It just wasn't as good as the other entries on this list for me. Water 7 offered a ton of variety, comedy, and stood as the backdrop for the single most emotional and compelling conversations in the entire series that I've seen anyway. To this date, Usopp and Luffy's interactions during this arc are still my favourite examples of creative writing and dialogue from the entire series. Also offering my favourite fight scene too between them. In addition to that, I love the way the City of Water 7 looked. The picturesque landscapes and waterways offered a lot in the way of world building and that's not even to mention the intriguing plot with Nico Robin and the swerve at the very end with Sanji being one step ahead of everybody at the train station. Thinking back to my page turn onto that reveal still makes me smile. I loved Eni's Lobby as a fantastic climax to the story Story, but Water 7 really did have everything else that made that arc as good as it was. It established characters, relationships, subversions, and it still had more compelling action to boot. For me, Water 7 was on another level and takes the number three spot easily. Number two, Alabasta. <laughs> Similar to the last entry, I spent a lot of time deliberating whether or not Alabasta would take the top spot or this one. And it's easy to see why. The Alabasta arc is lengthy, but not too long, and it is its very own intricate self-contained story, full of new characters, political structures, wonderful geography, wildlife, and action. But even taking all of that out of the equation, the Alabasta arc does a phenomenal job of interweaving emotion and feeling into the narrative through short but illuminating scenes like that between the old man and Luffy and Yuba, Vivi's lamenting at her country falling into ruin and even through all the major characters providing the single best send-off in the series which felt so distinctly One Piece it hurt. And that's not even to make mention of my favourite Warlord of the Sea in Crocodile. While we would later meet and face off against other Warlords of the Sea, some being even more formidable than Crocodile, there's no denying the charisma and Bond villainess type aura Croc brought to each and every single scene he engaged within, offering a moveset that posed interesting challenges to the themes, fights and overall plot of the story. Croc was a near-perfect inclusion for this arc and served it accordingly. But one more additional aspect that made Alabasta stand out amidst the rest was how it incorporated and made use of every single main character like no other. Utilizing all the Straw Hats and Luffy in tandem, creating a sense that everyone was struggling to the very end. It's a spectacular, action-packed, rich, and emotional roller coaster that I literally could not recommend more. Number 1. Marine Ford. 30 chapters. In 30 chapters, Oda created a climax that befitted not just a four-part saga, but created, established, and delivered an incredible climax, equally cathartic and tragic in measure, for the entire series so far. To reiterate, this wasn't just a great climax for the saga, but a great climax for the series so far. That shouldn't be possible, let alone in 30 chapters. Recontextualizing relationships established in the first chapter, during Alabasta, and thereafter. This arc takes all the best elements from all the other arcs and smashes them together in a war effort the likes of which I've not seen yet committed to the page of a manga. The struggles are visceral, the tension is high, and the battles are nothing short of brutal, with violence the likes of which we've not seen in the series and consequences that will echo throughout the pages of every subsequent volume I'll read through into the future. Marine Ford is the end game of One Piece, a story that shouldn't be possible to pull off, but somehow it was, and I was utterly floored by it. And while arcs like Innie's Lobby also concern themselves with just a climax like Marineford, unlike Eni's Lobby, Marineford introduces and is about Whitebeard and Ace, with the relationship taking center stage, acting as its very own standalone story in some measure, all the while introducing new characters, reintroducing old ones, establishing set pieces, and that's not even to mention the complicated action that literally everyone is taking part in. This was the arc that demonstrated so perfectly why Oda spending all that time world building and establishing characters over the course of the series worked so well in his favor. I have in the past seen shows or other pieces of media create a war setting, and while some are closer than others, none, in my opinion, even approach this level of satisfaction and urgency Marine Ford so effortlessly delivered. Ah! 
I'd like to extend a special thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's video. We've never been more reliant on the internet than we are today, and this reliance is rapidly increasing. Our entertainment, our finances, and even some of us have jobs that rely on a robust online infrastructure. As our online presence is ever increasing, we'd like to think we're safe too, and so we need proper security. Surfshark is a VPN service that protects your information from unwanted individuals by encrypting all the data that you send through the internet. But a great reason to use a VPN is for content that might be hidden behind certain region locks like Netflix does. With Surfshark, you can solve that problem by simply changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows, but it's great for me specifically because I want to watch One Piece on Netflix when it's inexplicably blocked in my country. This very moment, Surfshark VPN has a great deal going. By following my link in the description and using your promo code TNM, it not only gives you a whopping 85% off, but also three months of service totally for free. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in Trying it out for yourself. Now, back to the video. I figured out that when you get wet, your body hardens, so you can be clobbered when you're a big stiff. I'm angry and I'm wet. Okay, time to rank all nine of the straw hats. Don't hurt me. Ranking the Straw Hats was a much more difficult task than choosing my favorite arcs. I found myself flip-flopping between so many of them, but I had to make my decisions at the end of the day, so here they are. Let it be known, however, that before I dive in, just because certain Straw Hats are at the bottom of my ranking list here, that doesn't mean I don't like them. It just means that I like them less than the ones towards the top. So, coming in at number nine... Ah, just a little bit. Brooke. I like Brooke. I think he can be funny, and his backstory is one of the most tragic, if not the most tragic, out of all of the Straw Hats. And while this might be my lack of time spent with the character talking, I found personally that if I removed all of his crass gags about women's underwear, and removed his skeleton puns, while there is definitely a character beneath, I didn't see as much of that as I would have liked to outside of Thriller Bark. This could very easily change in the future, and I hope it does. From the little amount his character has gotten to shine in the series so far, what I have seen I very much enjoy so hopefully the future offers much more in the way of characterization for Brooke. Time to jump to number eight. Frankie. This might have been the toughest decision I made on the list. To say that I flipped back and forth between Frankie and the next straw hat on this list is nothing short of an understatement. However, despite Frankie's relatively low ranking here, I really do love his character. Of all of the straw hats, he might be one of the most charismatic. I enjoy him because he's a big, lovable goofball, but he also comes packed with some great utility in fighting and ship repairs. Frankie offers the gang their ship to continue their voyage, and in a lot of ways, this very ship saves them despite its very brief stint with them so far. However, perhaps the most impressive aspect of Frankie's character is that his introduction arc wasn't at all about him really, but instead about another. Robin. But despite that, this charismatic, robotic, skimpy trunk wearing, thousand sunny repairing, Madman managed to cement himself as part of the Straw Hats in a way so perfect I couldn't imagine the crew without him. But one character that has risen in my estimation to a great extent is coming next in my number seven spot. Chopper. For the absolute longest time, Chopper was at the very bottom of my ranking list. He was a character I didn't really have that much interest in, and while I didn't dislike the character, he was for the longest time the character that flirted with being boring the most for me. Not that he was boring, but more so because he never really had much to contribute besides being scared and doubtful of himself, which are the character traits of a much more interesting character that's much higher on this list. In short, he didn't have anything really that helped him stand out, which is a really strange strange thing to say about a transforming deer. However, once that was explored in Drum Island, the novelty that that sort of devil fruit ability provides left me saying, okay, what else do you have to offer to this dynamic? And really, he sort of fell into the background with characters like Nami, Usopp, and Luffy taking center stage thereafter. That is, until this happened. <laughs> 
this sort of enhancement was exactly what Chopper needed in order to remain competitive and to remain interesting in combat in ways that only he can. These sorts of techniques, much like the Kaioken from Dragon Ball, are gambles. Very much this is a dire situation move where the host throws the dice in what he identifies as a moment of absolute desperation. And once this moment popped off in Eni's lobby for the little guy, I began looking at Chopper more closely, which was great as he became a more active character thereafter, engaging in the battle with Moria on Thriller Park in a very creative, rich way, employing his knowledge of anatomy and medicine to prove crucial in the closing moments of the encounter. I hope to see more from him in the future, but that's enough about Chopper for now. Let's look at the straw hat who took my number six spot. Sanji. Now that we're approaching the middle of this list, we will start seeing straw hats that once occupied the top spot more and more. Sanji is the first such character that occupied the rank of number one in my estimation. However, as other characters shone brighter, he remained the same and, in some respects, in my opinion, became less interesting. Very quickly, right after we were introduced to him in Barate, in the arc immediately following that, Sanji asserted himself as being one of the key players in the dynamic of the straw hats, and he still very much is today. Spanning from Barate all the way through to Eni's lobby, for 400 chapters, Sanji proved to be the difference maker and a capable fighter. Whether that be in Arlong Park saving Luffy, in Alabasta as Mr. Prince, or in Water 7 as he anticipates something no one else did in waiting at the train station. But perhaps the most interesting part of his character for me was his dynamic when dealing with women. From the very beginning, he placed women on a pedestal, treating them like royalty, straddling and pushing the line of chivalry. And while this proved to be challenging in a lot of aspects throughout Alabasta onward, this particular particular trait in Sanji was highlighted during Eni's lobby by Nami as a negative, which I was so excited for as it offered a really refreshing change of pace from the perverted character that seemed to be so prevalent in shonen and eastern comics in general. From Alabasta through to Eni's lobby, Sanji was my favourite character. but perhaps I had gotten the wrong impression of him. As when Thriller Bark rolled around, and even now in later arcs like Return to Shabaudi, he seems to be leaning into a more traditional, perverted aspect of his character that I personally found incredibly boring compared to the direction I thought they were going to take with him. Now, if you like him, more power to you. I still enjoy him from time to time too, but nowhere near what I did. Which, for me, is a shame. Number 5. Zoro. I get the distinct feeling that this one might be very controversial. I'm sure that given the kind of character Zoro is, he'd be at the top or at least second from the top for many of the people watching this video. And it's easy to see why. He's strong, he's badass, and he's incredibly loyal to his friends. And while he bests a lot of the Straw Hats lore on this list, I find him to be fairly middle of the road when it comes to entertainment. In fact, I still think Sanji offers a much more interesting dynamic than Zoro, however, there isn't anything about Zoro that I don't like, so that's why he beat Sanji for me in this instance. But what stops him from being higher on this list, like many of you would like him to be, is his formulaic use in the narrative. If you go back over the story from Zoro's recruitment all the way to the end of Thriller Bark's main story, all Zoro did for the most part was sleep, drink, fight the second strongest guys, and be the quote cool guy in the group, which I didn't find particularly interesting. However, since then, there's been a tremendous effort on behalf of Oda to draw attention and highlight Zoro's role as the perfect first mate for Luffy, which he demonstrated quite effectively throughout the series, in moments like Water 7, against Kuma in Thriller Bark, and even in training with Hawkeye. These moments elevate him from what would have been a lower position for me to a middle position. And I love him. Next up... Yeah! Nami. Nami's a fantastic character, an all-rounder. She's funny, cool, clever, and she offers a lot of variety in how the story can be told. She's not the strongest, but when it gets down to the wire, she often comes through with a clutch play, either by pickpocketing something of value or stealing something crucial. Unlike Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji, she doesn't have the option of brute forcing her way out, which is so interesting in a shonen compared to everything else. From the moment she was introduced all the way through Alabasta, she was my favorite character, and to be honest, would have remained as such had the dynamic in the group not changed so much. With her character now sort of finding herself as a person to save rather than someone who does the saving or makes clutch plays anymore. But who knows, maybe that will change as the story unravels. Maybe she'll regain the number one spot again. But as of right now, she's my number four, so let's dive into the top three. Usopp. 
Now we are on the business end of this list. These three characters change on a chapter by chapter basis, but all of them offer tons in the way of creative character moments and dialogue entanglements. And while Usopp is at number three here, he has on a number of occasions occupied the top spot also. Easily one of the best characters the series has produced, Usopp offers every story he takes a leading role in invaluable opportunities to utilize his fear and bravery to create moments equal parts tense and emotional in measure. Whether it be through his interactions with Nami in Arlong Park, his fight alongside Chopper against the Barrack Works in Alabasta, or his best friend Soga King. And that's not even to make mention of the part he played in the single greatest dialogue exchange I've seen come out of Water 7 and this series. Usopp is amazing and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. But as of right now, there are two I find more interesting. Oi, Robin. While characters like Chopper and Usopp or Sanji and Zoro share a lot in common with each other, I was beginning to get scared that no straw hat that would be introduced in the future would be able to feel like they had their own identity. Enter Nico Robin. <laughs> The way with which this character integrates herself into the story was, out of the Straw Hats, the most interesting to me. Not as a good guy like Sanji and not as a neutral force like Nami, but instead as one of the more formidable antagonists presented to us in the story at that time. Proving to be equal parts calm and cool while also being super intelligent and quippy. She also comes with my favorite flashback sequence that illuminates so much more about the wider world and world government than I was anticipating at the time of reading it. I love her dialogue, I love her powers, I adore that her motivations still color her decisions even to this day hundreds of chapters after the first time we met her and I love that the fact that she's a girl doesn't play a role in her character. She could easily be a guy and be just as interesting. I love the character and I cannot wait to see what's to come for her in the future now that I know she might have some interesting info regarding Dragon. But that leaves one straw hat and I think you all know who that is. <laughs> Luffy. I didn't think I was going to like Luffy as much as I did throughout this series. With him being the character we spend the most time with by far in the entire story, and with him being introduced to us in the very first chapter, there's been only one single moment in the entire story where I thought his character didn't make sense. That being on Whiskey Peak when he tried to kill Zoro, but aside from that, Luffy has literally only gotten more interesting to me over time. Chapter by chapter in the different things he does, sometimes big, sometimes small, but always informed by his character as it paints and colors every piece of dialogue he spouts. Luffy is a perfect protagonist for this story. Obviously, he's exciting and endearing, which are fantastic traits to have for a protagonist, but what I think makes him a terrific one is how active he is as a character within the story. Unlike a lot of other characters, he doesn't sit back and let the plot just happen to him. Luffy happens to the plot. He's a go-getter and for better or worse, goes out into the world and causes great things to happen and sometimes terrible things to happen, but always entertaining. With a backstory that gets drip-fed to us throughout the course of the entire series, Luffy isn't only interesting but comes with far more depth than a character like him might look to have on first viewing, with Oda taking specific care in establishing every aspect of him, fleshing him out and forcing us to see him in a very visceral, believable way. And in doing so, he is now up there with Goku as some of my favorite characters in all of fiction. He's courageous, he's kind, and he's ambitious beyond measure. He makes the impossible seem possible. He's Monkey D. Luffy, and he's the captain and my favorite of the Straw Hat Pirates. And thus concludes today's video. It feels so good to be back, and I'm really excited to get back into the swing of things next week with Fishman Island. But that'll do it for this video. I've been Totally Not Mark. I'll see you all next week. And thank you so much for waiting, and thank you so much for watching.